Hello, Cornerstone Church, and to all who are watching our online service from beautiful Birch Corner, New Brunswick, Canada. And wow, has God not had his protecting and delivery hand upon New Brunswick, sparing us from major health issues and deaths with COVID-19. And let's praise him for that today. And let's give him glory. And let's at the same time thank him for our province and for our Premier Higgs and our Chief Medical Officer of New Brunswick, Dr. Jennifer Russell, and all of our frontline workers, our doctors, our nurses, our first responders, and all of our essential workers. We have much to praise God for and thank Him for and express our thanks and our appreciation to all of these above that I have mentioned. Looking forward, Lord willing, to finally being together with you all in person, keeping that six feet, but our leadership team is praying about an outdoor service or possibly indoor service for next Sunday. Uh, Lord willing, we'll uh, be making that uh, decision one way or another at 1045. So do check your Facebook page uh, or uh, your email for this information uh, coming uh, later this week. But for now, we praise God that we can still connect with you all uh, via our online service. Would you believe it? This is our ninth online service since March the 22nd. Wow. God has been good to give us this opportunity. Our theme today is the greatness of our God, or the great name of Jesus. And indeed, God is great, and He is worthy of our praise, He's worthy of our honor, and our glory, and our worship, and the name of Jesus is the name which is above every name, and the name by which every knee should bow down and give Him honor, and glory, and praise, and majesty, because He alone is deserving of all of our worship. My favorite hymn is a hymn entitled, How Great Thou Art. And it's a hymn written by Carl Boberg, and he could pen these majestic words to that great hymn, How Great Thou Art. O Lord my God, when I in awesome wonder, consider all the works thy hands have made. I see the stars, I hear the mighty thunder, thy power throughout the universe displayed. Then sings my soul, my Savior, God to thee, how great thou art, how great thou art. When through the woods and forest glades I wander, and hear the birds sing sweetly in the trees. When I look down from lofty mountain grandeur, and hear the brook, and feel the gentle breeze. Then sings my soul, my Savior God to thee, how great thou art, how great thou art. Thou art. And when I think that God, his son, not sparing, sent him to die, I scarce can take it in, that on the cross, my burden gladly bearing, he bled and died to take away my sin. Then sings my soul, my Savior God, to thee, how great thou art, how great thou art. And then when Christ shall come with shout of acclamation and take me home, what joy shall fill my heart. Then I shall bow in humble adoration, and there proclaim, My God, how great thou art. Then sings my soul, my Savior God to thee, How great thou art, how great thou art. For our call to worship today, I invite you to read with me wherever you are, if you can find a Bible nearby, and read with me uh, today from the Old Testament book of the Psalms, Psalm 145 verses 1 to 13, and uh, we will read here with you uh, this, this day, beginning here at verse 1. I will extol thee, my God, O King, and I will bless thy name forever and ever. Every day will I bless thee, and I will praise thy name forever and ever. Great is Jehovah, and greatly to be praised, and his greatness is unsearchable. One generation shall laud thy works to another, and shall declare thy mighty acts of the glorious majesty of thine honor, and of thy wondrous works will I meditate. And men shall speak of thy might, of thy terrible or thy awesome acts, and I will declare thy greatness. They shall utter the memory of thy great goodness, and shall sing of thy righteousness. Jehovah is gracious and merciful and slow to anger and of great loving kindness. 
Jehovah is good to all, and his tender mercies are over all of his works. All thy works shall give thanks unto thee, O Jehovah, and thy saints shall bless thee. They shall speak of the glory of thy kingdom, and talk of thy power, to make known to the sons of men his mighty acts, and the glory of the majesty of his kingdom. Thy kingdom is an everlasting kingdom, and thy dominion endureth throughout all generations. And all God's people say amen to that amazing portion of the word of God, Psalm 145. Father in heaven, you are indeed a great God, as the psalmist reminds us of here today in Psalm 145, and you are indeed worthy of all praise and of all honor and all glory. Oh God, we see your fingerprints in all of creation all around us. You are great in your creation and how you created the universe in just six days. All the galaxies, all the planets, all the stars, too many to count, the sun and the moon and all the vast oceans and the rivers and the lakes and the streams and the mountains and the valleys and all of the wildlife and all the plant life. And you created man, the first man, Adam, and you gave him a lovely wife, Eve, and you ordained the first marriage, the family unit, and then sin entered the picture in the Garden of Eden. Ever since then, man has been under the curse of sin and has been desperate need of a Savior, a perfect lamb to be slain for sin. And you in your sovereignty provided that lamb in the person of your dear son, the Lord Jesus Christ, some 2,000 years ago on a hill called Calvary, where he died and where he shed his precious blood, hanging there, bearing our sins in his own body, forsaken by the Father because of our sin and loving us to the end and laying down his life and being obedient even to the death of the cross so that we might have redemption, we might have forgiveness of sin and we might have the gift of salvation and eternal life through Jesus Christ and that we might now be able to come into a relationship with your son through repentance of sin and believing in your name and now we can bring glory to you, God, into your, your name for which you created us. Oh, Lord, you worked in mysterious ways and you have wonders to perform. Who would have ever imagined, God, that just with a flick of the switch, if you would, you put the whole world at a standstill to get man's attention? Now, Lord, we'd ask that indeed that man would turn to you. Man in their need and in their desperation and in their fears and their anxieties and their helplessness and their hopelessness. Lord, whatever their needs are that have come about because of COVID-19, that you would direct their hearts and direct their minds and their wills to turn to you and to cry out to you for mercy and for salvation in these days, we pray. Bring hope where there seems to be no hope, O oh God, as man turns to you in Jesus' name. Bless our service now. In Jesus' name, amen. There's a song written by Natalie Grant uh, entitled, Your Great Name. And it goes like this. The lost are saved, find their way at the sound of your great name. All condemned feel no shame at the sound of your great name. Every fear has no place at the sound of your great name. The enemy has to leave at the sound of your great name. Jesus, worthy is the Lamb that was slain for us, Son of God and man, you are high and lifted up. And all the world, indeed all the world, and all the nations will praise your great name. All the weak find their strength at the sound of your great name. Hungry souls receive grace at the sound of your great name. The fatherless, they find their rest at the sound of your great name. Sick are healed, and the dead are raised at the sound of your great name. Jesus, worthy is the Lamb that was slain for us, Son of God and men. You are high and lifted up, and all the world will praise your great name. Redeemer, my healer, Lord Almighty, my Savior, Defender, you are my King. Blessed to be. 
be here with you this morning. I have a reading here taken from The Jesus You May Not Know by Dr. David Jeremiah. I want you to better know the dearest person in my life. I want to introduce you to the man who has rescued me from death, filled, with, filled me with hope, directed me in the decisions that have shaped my destiny, employed me in his global work, and is currently preparing a new home for me in a place where I'll never grow old. He is my mentor and master, and it's a joy to introduce you to the Jesus you may not know. None of us know him as fully as we should, for Jesus is the mystery of the ages, the almighty God whose throne is in heaven, the Nazarene carpenter who wiped sweat from his brow, the stranger of Galilee who napped in a boat, the teacher whose wisdom changed the ethics of the world, the prisoner whose execution was excruciating, the corpse who borrowed a tomb, the body who returned to life, the savior who bled for the world, the hero who divided history into BC and AD, and the glorious king whose return is right on schedule. So multifaceted is he that the Bible overflows with names, titles, and designations to describe him. The Alpha and Omega, and the Anointed One, the Beloved Son, and the Bright and Morning Star, the Carpenter of Nazareth, and the Christ of Glory, the Deliverer, and the Day Star from on high, the Everlasting Lord, the First and the Last, and the Faithful and True, the great I Am and the Good Shepherd, the High Priest and the Holy One of Israel, Emmanuel, God with us, the Judge of all the earth, the King of the Jews and the King of Kings, the Lily of the Valley, the Lamb of God, the Lion of Judah and the Lord of Lords, the Man of Sorrows and the Morning Star, the Nazarene, the Overcomer, the Prince of Peace, the Redeemer, the Rabbi, and the Rock, the Son of God, the Son of Man, and the Savior of the world, the Teacher who, teacher who came from God, the Virgin Son, the Word of God, the Way, the Truth, and the Life, Yeshua, Joshua, Jesus. How do you explain someone like that? In a book of Christmas stories, I once found this description of Christ. He was a working man, a ragged carpenter with neither a roof above his head nor a pillow beneath it, sleeping under the stars or in borrowed beds. His robe a blanket, his nightlight the moon. For 36 months he drifted about doing good and telling stories. He never hurt a soul. He healed the sick, taught the masses, fed the hungry, walked across the seas and preached the good news. Wherever he went, the miraculous broke out at weddings, at funerals, on the land and on the lake, on the mountainside and in the city streets. He became the help of the helpless and the hope of the hopeless. He turned water into wine, and with bread and fish he fed a multitude. Yet he himself was sometimes hungry, and in his death he cried out in thirst. He was buried in a donated mausoleum, yet his tomb, guarded by the Roman soldiers, was opened by heavenly agents and found. And for 2,000 years, we can say that all the angels of heaven, all the demons of hell, all the stars in the sky, and all the men of the earth have never understood the influence of this gentle child in swaddling clothes 
who was laid in a manger with no crib for a bed. Jesus Christ, our Lord. Because Jesus lived in history, there's no doubt about that. And because his life was recorded, the entire Bible is about him. We can learn about him. But because he rose from the grave and is now alive, we can have a personal relationship with him and come to know him more deeply and intimately. You can know him personally, who is the beloved son, the everlasting Lord, the promised Messiah, the sacrificial intercessor, the compassionate servant, the powerful provider, the trusted teacher, the great I am, the selfless savior, the worthy king, and my best friend. May he be yours too. Thank you so much, uh, Kim, for that uh, amazing reading on the person of our Lord Jesus Christ, and it summarizes who he really is, and the person that he is for you to call upon uh, to indeed be your best friend. He desires that personal relationship with you, and we'll talk more about that here in our service moving forward today and how you can personally have that relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. So thank you again, uh, Kim. Uh, Kim Upton, one of our young ladies of our church here at Cornerstone Bible Church. So great to have her with us here today. Amen. I'd like to read to you before the message today uh, a hymn in, entitled His Name is Wonderful. It's not the chorus, His Name is Wonderful, but it's a hymn uh, with that same name, written by Alfred B. Smith, uh, who was an amazing songwriter, uh, who's now gone on to be with the Lord. But let me read the words of this hymn to you today. His name above all other names shall men and angels sing, in time and in eternity, Redeemer, Savior, King. Tis written on the walls of time, Emblazoned on the trees, the mighty thunder speaks it, and tis whispered by the breeze. His name is wonderful, so very wonderful, no other can with him compare, Redeemer, Savior, King. He built the heavens, he made the stars, and he gave to each a place, and a name I might add. The waters in his hands he holds and keeps the sun in space. Creation is his handiwork. Eternity is his plan. His power in nature he displayed. His image gave to man. His name is wonderful. So very wonderful. No other can with him compare. Redeemer, Savior, and King. Almighty, everlasting God, how wonderful thou art. Oh, may thy will be in service, be the joy of every heart. Direct us and love us and guide us and keep us in thy tender care and in thine own good time and way may we thy glory share his name is wonderful so very wonderful no other can with him compare redeemer savior and king and we say amen to that hymn today and we agree certainly that there is no other name so wonderful as the name of Jesus. And we do trust and pray that you know this person whose name is Jesus. And if you do not know him personally, that even today you might call upon him to be your Savior today. You've heard of three kinds of Christians, perhaps. There is the robo Christian who has to be pushed wherever they go. There's the sailboat Christian who always goes with the wind. Wherever the wind blows, that's where they go. Uh, no anchor for the boat. The third kind of Christian is the steamboat Christian. They make up their mind where they ought to go and they go there regardless of the wind or the weather. They know who their God is and they give their lives to following Him. 
The story is told of Daniel Webster. When he was in the prime of his manhood, he was dining with a company of literary men in Boston, Massachusetts. And during the dinner, the conversation turned upon the subject of Christianity. Mr. Webster frankly stated his belief in the divinity of Christ and his dependence upon the atonement of our Savior. And one of the men, kind of a skeptic of sorts, spoke up and said, Mr. Webster, can, can you comprehend how Christ could be both God and man? Mr. Webster promptly replied, No, sir, I cannot comprehend it. If I could comprehend him, he would be no greater than myself. I feel that I need a superhuman Savior, Jesus Christ. You see, friends, Daniel Webster was such a man, a steamboat Christian, if you would, who knew his God and was not ashamed to stand up for his God and let people know that Jesus was his God and he was his Savior of his life. Today we start a new series on the life of Christ entitled Survival Strategies from the Savior. In military combat, you call it W2S, or the will to survive. Here's a quote by an unknown author. You can survive three weeks without food, three days without water, three minutes without air, but not three seconds without hope. So much truth to that indeed. And who is it that gives us hope to survive in the midst of COVID-19 pandemic or in any other crisis in our lives for that matter? None other than the person of Jesus Christ. For the Christian, you and I can get through this pandemic with hope because of our relationship that we have with the God of hope. Jesus Christ. Each week moving forward, we will examine a survival strategy from the life of Christ found in the Gospels of Christ to help us survive in COVID-19 and beyond. Today's survival strategy is know that Jesus is God. Know that Jesus is God. So important, is it not, that you and I know or believe strongly in this fundamental doctrine of the Christian faith that Jesus is indeed God. He is very God come in the flesh. The word in theological terms is the deity of Christ. And the deity of Christ simply means that Jesus is fully God, yet he is fully man. The God-man, if you would. How few people out there who actually know Jesus. In fact, there is a whole world of people who do not know Jesus. I dare say even some Christians out there who are shockingly unaware of who Jesus really is in their lives. No wonder so many people have a struggle to survive. They have no bedrock solid foundation or authority to build their life on when they don't know or believe that Jesus is indeed God, who he says he is, and many others who testify that he is God. Do you, my friend, know that Jesus is God? Do you believe he is very God come in the flesh? He indeed is God with us. His name that we often refer to at Christmas reveals this to us, Emmanuel, in Matthew 1, 21, meaning God with us. Yet many cults and false teachers of our day do not believe that he is God. And instead they believe he is a God, or a small g, or just a prophet, or just a, a good moral man, or a good teacher, but not God. There are even some Protestant churches that do not believe he is God, but that he is as God, but not God. What did John say in the little Johns? The second John? 
Verse 7, For many deceivers have gone out into this world who do not confess that Jesus Christ is coming in the flesh. That is, that Jesus is God in the flesh. This is a deceiver and an antichrist, John said. And that is one, an antichrist, meaning one who is against Christ. Or against Jesus, who is God. Then the Apostle Paul stated convincingly and clearly that Jesus is God with these words in John chapter 1, verse 1. In the beginning was the Word. If you notice there in your Bible, the word Word there is capitalized. That's a reference to a person, and that person is Jesus Christ, the living Word. In the beginning was the Word, and then notice it, and the Word, that is Jesus, was with God. And then notice it, and the Word, Jesus, was God. Do we need it any more clearer than that? Dear ones, if you attest the validity that Jesus is indeed God, I think that's very clear, is it not? And now here in our text for this message entitled Survival Strategies, Survival Strategy number one, to know that Jesus is God, we, we discover why He indeed is God in a body. Let me read for us our text here in John chapter 5 of the Gospel of John. John chapter 5, beginning here at verse, verse 30 for the main text of our message. I can of myself do nothing as I hear I judge, and my judgment is righteous because I do not seek mine own will, but the will of the Father who sent me. If I bear witness of myself, my witness is not true. Notice these are all words that are in, in the red letter here. That, that means that these are the very words that Jesus spoke. So they, they demand our attention, certainly. In verse 32, There is another who bears witness of me, and I know that the witness which he witnesses of me is true. You have sent to John, and he has borne witness to the truth. Yet I do not receive testimony from man, but I say these things that you may be saved. He was the burning and shining lamp. And you were willing for a time to rejoice in his light. But I have a greater witness than John's. For the works which the Father has given me to finish, the very works that I do, bear witness of me that the Father has sent me. And the Father himself who sent me has testified of me. You have neither heard his voice at any time nor seen his form. But you do not have his word abiding in you because whom he sent him you do not believe. You search the scriptures, Jesus says. For in them you think that you have eternal life, and these are they which testify of me. But you are not willing to come to me that you may have life. Knowing that Jesus is God. Father, we cannot live by bread alone, but we can live only by the word of God. The word that proceeds out of your mouth, the very words of Jesus that were spoken, the living bread, the Lord Jesus who spoke to us and who will always enrich and satisfy us. Lord, move our hearts to receive your word. Today we pray in Jesus' name, amen. To help us know that Jesus is indeed God, in a body, Jesus states three significant claims that prove his deity here in the Gospel of John, actually beginning at verse 19 through to verse 47. First, Jesus claimed to be equal with God, verses 19 through 23. And we see that he is equal with God in his works. Notice, if you would, verse 19. Jesus answered and said to them, most assuredly, I say to you, the Son can do nothing of himself, but what he sees the Father do, for whatever he does, the Son also does in like manner. So he's equal with God in his works. And then he is equal with God in his intelligence. Notice verse 20. For the Father loves the Son and shows him all things that he himself does, and he will show him greater works than these that you may marvel. And then he is equal with God in, in his power to, to raise the dead. Verse 21, for as the Father raises the dead and gives life to them, even so the Son gives life to whom he will. And he is equal with God in his authority to execute judgment. 
Verse 22, for the Father judges no one, but has committed all judgment to the Son, that is, to Jesus, the Son of God. And then he is equal with God in receiving honor. Verse 23, that all should honor the Son, Jesus, just as they honor the Father, that is God the Father. He who does not honor the Son does not honor the Father who has sent me. Then in John 10, 30, Jesus clearly states, I and my Father are one. That is, they are equal. Therefore, if Jesus is equal with God, dear ones, he must be God. Proof number two. Jesus claimed to have authority to raise the dead. Jesus, in fact, describes for us four different resurrections here in verses 24 to 29 of our text today. First is the resurrection of lost sinners who believe into eternal life. And we see that here in verse 24. Most assuredly, I say to you, he who hears my word and believes in him who has sent me has everlasting life and shall not come into judgment, but has passed from death unto life. Will you be in that number? And we'll tell you how you can be in that number if you're not sure of that at the end of our message today. Second is the resurrection of the Lord himself. Verse 26. For as the Father hath life in himself, so he has granted the Son to have life in himself. The words here, in himself, is of course Jesus referring to his own resurrection three days after his own death on the cross. Third is the future resurrection of life when believers are raised from the dead. Verse 28, do not marvel, Jesus says. Again, the red words speaking of Jesus, the red letters speaking of Jesus' words. For the hour is coming in which all who are in the graves will hear his voice. That is, those believers whose bodies who have died and their bodies are in the grave waiting for the rapture to unite with their soul and their spirit in the clouds. And the Lord returns in the clouds. And come forth those who have done good to the resurrection of life. Paul was very explicit about this, was he not? In 1 Thessalonians, 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, when, when Paul's Speaking of the Lord's coming in the clouds, or what we know and refer to as the rapture, or the catching away of the, the bride of Christ to unite with Him in the clouds. Uh, every believer and follower of Christ, uh, since the uh, day of Pentecost, uh, until the rapture, uh, will be caught up to meet the Lord. And we read here in 1 Thessalonians uh Chapter 4 and, and verse 16, For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, and with the voice of an archangel, and with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. All the bodies of believers that have died and been buried will rise first when Jesus returns. Then we who are alive, that is the Christians who are alive when he returns, uh, and remain shall be caught up, there's a word, to be raptured up together with them in the clouds, to meet the Lord in the air, and thus we shall always be with the Lord. Wow, what a day that will be. And I wouldn't want to miss it for the world. Fourth is the resurrection of condemnation. The resurrection of condemnation, verse 29b of our text in John chapter 5. Jesus says, and those who have done evil to the resurrection of condemnation. This resurrection of condemnation is, of course, for the lost, that is, the unbelieving, those who reject Jesus Christ and reject his message of salvation and die in their sins, never having repented of sin and trusted in Jesus Christ as personal Lord and Savior. Not a resurrection that we want to be a part of or our loved ones to be a part of, for sure. The truth to go here, then, is that if Jesus raised the dead, he himself was raised from the dead, then he indeed is God. Proof number three, the valid witness, witnesses who support Jesus' claims to be deity. 
Here in uh, verses 30 to 47, the Lord Jesus himself describes for us five valid witnesses who support his claim to deity. These witnesses prove that Jesus is not some lunatic, or he's not some liar, but that he indeed is the Lord, the Lord God indeed himself. Witness number one is the Lord Jesus himself. The Lord Jesus himself. In verse 31, Jesus bears witness to himself. In verse 31, if I bear witness of myself, my witness is not true. What Jesus was stating here was that he himself bears witness of his deity. But legally in a court of law, one's own witness wasn't enough. Your witness had to be backed up by other witnesses, which he does have, as we'll see in a few moments. But notice, if you would, John 8, verse 14. John 8, verse 14. We read these words, And Jesus answered and said unto them, to these religious Pharisees of the day, Even I, if I bear witness of myself, my witness is true. For I know where I come from and where I'm going, but you do not know where I come from and where I am going. Here Jesus points out that his witness is true since he knew more about himself than any other person. And then he reaffirms his own deity after the Jews said he was possessed with a demon when he said these powerful words in uh, verse 58. And Jesus said, Most assuredly, I say unto you, them before Abraham was, I am. So Jesus here bore witness uh, to himself, but knowing the Jewish Sanhedrin or the religious ruling council of the day would not accept his witness, Jesus then called on three other witnesses to verify or to prove his deity. Besides, Jewish law required two or more witnesses, and Jesus gave three. Witness number two came from John the Baptist, verse 33 to 35. Note, if you would, verse 33 of John chapter 5. You have sent to John, and he has borne witness to the truth. The Sanhedrin had already interrogated John the Baptist back in chapter 1 of the, Gospel of, jo of, of, of the Gospel of John. And when they came to him then, here in John 5, John faithfully declared to them uh, that he was, uh, that, that Jesus declares that John was a witness of him. And, and John had already faithfully declared that back in John chapter 1. He, he knew about the Lord Jesus. John, John told them that Jesus was the Lord in John chapter 1 verse 23. And that he was the Lamb of God. Behold the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sins of the world, in chapter 1, verse 29, and then he, that, that he was also the Son of God. John declares that about Jesus in verse 34 of John chapter 1. Jesus, in fact, likened John, John the Baptist, to a burning and a shining lamp here in verse 35. That, re, that, that reflected Jesus, the light of the world. And Jesus, of course, is the light. He said, I am the light of the world. Excuse me. Jesus said that to us, that he is the light. He's the light that shines into the dark, sinful world, and he desires to shine into your darkened heart because of sin and bring light and bring forgiveness and bring salvation and bring hope to your heart today. Back in John chapter 1, verse 7, we read that John the Baptist was sent to bear witness of the light that all men through him might believe. And that's exactly what John did until his cruel death where he was beheaded all because of his faith and being a faithful person to bear witness to the light Jesus Christ. How about you, my Christian friend today? How, how's your witness out there? Are, are, are you too bearing a witness of, of the light Jesus Christ? Are you declaring to others the good news of Jesus Christ, that He indeed is God, that He is indeed Lord of all, and that He is the only Lamb of God, which takes away the sins of the world, that He is the Son of God, or very God, come in the flesh, so that men might believe in Him as Savior and Lord. 
And when we make this decision, we too will be persuaded or convinced that Jesus is indeed God. So too, you and I, who profess faith in Jesus Christ, are to be a burning and be a shining light in this dark, sinful world for Jesus Christ. We are to be the little lights, if you would, that reflect the light, the Lord Jesus Christ, into our sphere of influence around us. As Jesus said in Matthew 5, 16, let your light so shine before him that they may see your good works and glorify your Father, which is in heaven. So who was witness number one? Jesus himself. And witness number two, John the Baptist. Then we have the third proof that Jesus' claim of deity is true, found in verse 36 of our text here. But I have a greater witness, Jesus says, than John's. For the works which the Father has given me to finish, the very works that I do, bear witness of me that the Father has sent me. So what is the third, the third proof of Jesus' claim to deity? Or his claim to be God. Witness number three. His own works. As we read here in verse 36. You see it here? Jesus' miracles. All the wonderful works that he did. While he was here on earth for just those three years. Such a short time. They prove his deity. His claiming. Or his calming rather the stormy waters. His saving and healing the paralyzed man on his stretcher. Brought down through a roof. To Jesus, his healing the blind man and the ten lepers, his feeding of five thousand men plus women and kids without any deluxe fish and chips in those days. Wow! But with just two small fishes and and five loaves of bread, he multiplied them to feed that crowd that day. His raising the dead, as we mentioned, his casting out demons, all attest to his deity. That he indeed is very God. For who else could do all of these miracles but God himself? Amen and amen. Critics yet will say, well, weren't there other miraculous things done by other men in, in the Bible? Why, yeah, yeah, there was. Moses did miracles. Elijah did miracles. The Apostle Paul did miracles. And there was others that did miracles in the Bible, the Old Testament and the New Testament, showing that they were men sent of God for that season. But the point is this, none of these men ever claimed to be the very Son of God. No true humble servant of God, able to perform mighty works, would ever claim to be God himself. But the fact that Jesus made this claim, backed up his mighty works, and his perfect life is evidence that indeed that his claim is valid. Even Nicodemus, a religious Pharisee, a ruler of the Jews, recognized that anyone who, who did what Jesus did must be from God. Listen to what Nicodemus said back in John chapter 3, verse 2. He says, he came to Jesus by night, Nicodemus did, and said to Jesus, Rabbi, or teacher, we know that you are a teacher come from God. No one can do these signs that you do unless God is with him. By the way, we believe that sometime after Jesus' discourse here with Nicodemus, that he did become, indeed, a Christ follower himself. How about some application here? Dear people, there's, there's no point, you and I, declaring the message of Jesus Christ if we don't have a life to back it up. Then that's why I need to ask myself, do others, by my life and by my good works and by my love for Jesus, and, and, and others see Jesus in my life? That's a kind of a soul-searching question, is it not? It was said by the pagans and the unbelieving of Peter and John, these two followers of Christ, these disciples of Christ in the early church in Acts chapter 4, verse 13, that they had been with Jesus. That, that was the, the testimony of, of unbelieving people about Peter and John. I wonder, do people see by my life and by your life that I too, that you too have been with Jesus. If not, beloved, I need to make some changes in my own life. Because one day, I'm going to stand ashamed before my Lord and my King on that great judgment day if I don't make those changes today. With the judgment seat of Christ for all believers. I need to repent and make those changes today in my life. So that others might see Jesus in my life. 
whatever God speaks to me to do and to stop doing, I need to do so that His name and His life is seen in my life. Interesting that James later wrote in James chapter 2, verse 18, but someone will say, you have faith, and I have works. Show me your faith without your works, and I will show you my faith by my works. Now, was James saying here that we're saved by our works? Some might read that into that, but it's not saying that. Contrary to that, no, he was simply saying that if we have saving faith in Jesus, we will show it by our works, you see. So this wasn't a contradiction here in Scripture. It wasn't a contradiction to Paul's writings uh, back in Ephesians chapter 2. Are, are we saved by our works? No. That's why Paul wrote clearly for us in Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8 and 9, for by grace are you saved through faith. And that not of yourselves, it is a gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. So clearly, dear ones, I am not saved by my works, as hard as I may try. But that doesn't mean I'm off the hook, and, and I don't have to do good works. Not at all. Too often we forget verse 10, which says, For we are His workmanship, or we are His masterpiece, created unto good works. Where God saved us to do good works. We were created to do good works. So if, I, if, if I've been saved by the blood of the Lamb, I will show my faith by my works. As someone aptly said, show me a Christian, show me their life. How true. My life should be a living epistle or a living Bible for all to read, should it not? As a follower of Christ, a true follower of Christ. And for some, it may be the only Bible that they might read. What are they reading by the Bible of my life? Are they seeing Jesus? Witness number four, God the Father himself. God the Father himself. Notice verse 32 of John chapter 5. There is another who bears witness of me, and I know that the witness which he witnesses of me is true. The word another here, another here, is a reference to his Father, to God the Father here. He would, God the Father would, and he did bear witness of Jesus. And then in verse 37, Jesus reaffirms who this other witness was here in verse 37, and the Father himself, there it is, who sent me has testified of me. You have neither heard his voice at any other time or seen his form. So we have the witness of our Lord himself. We have the witness of John the Baptist. We have the witness of Jesus' own works. And we have the witness of the Father. And the last line of evidence, or the last proof for Jesus' claim of deity is found in verses 38 to 47. And that is witness number five, the Holy Scriptures. The Holy Scriptures. The Jewish scribes, the religious leaders of Jesus' day, had the Scriptures. More specifically, they had the Old Testament Scriptures, which bear witness to Jesus Christ from His birth. Isaiah chapter 7, verse 40, 14, to His death, you can read about in Psalm 22 and Isaiah 53, are two of the more classic chapters of His death in the Old Testament. And you can even read about His return, or His coming again, in Zechariah chapter 14, verse 4. Yet they were blind to Him being their own Messiah. Why? Well, for one thing, they did not permit the Word of God to generate faith in their heart. Notice verse 38. But you do not have His Word, excuse me, binding in you because whom He sent, Him you do not believe. So there Jesus was in the very midst of them, uh, the Messiah, God Himself, but yet they still weren't believing in Him. Verse 39 is probably a statement of the fact, and, 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 and a, a fact rather, not a command, and, and could be rendered. Verse 39, you search the scriptures, for in them you think you have eternal life, and these are they which testify of me, Jesus states. You see, these Jewish scribes sought to know the word of God, but they did not know the God of the word, Jesus Christ. You don't get eternal life by studying this book as important as the Word of God is. You get eternal life, my friend, by believing in the person of Jesus Christ who is found in the Scriptures, in this precious book from Genesis 
through to Revelation. Please understand the scriptures do not save, but they show us about the one who does save. Faith coming by hearing and hearing by the word of God. You see, it's the hearing and the reading and the hearing that points us to the one who will save us, points us to the one who we are to put our faith in, in how to be saved by repenting of our sin and believing in Jesus Christ, that He is God and that He died for our sins as the Lamb of God. And He rose again to give us new life and eternal life. You see, these Jews knew the Scriptures. These scribes, these Jews, they were even involved in religion, quote-unquote, if you would. But they weren't willing to come to Jesus. And we see this here in verse 40. But you are not willing to come to me. Jesus speaking to these religious leaders of the day, these scribes and Pharisees, that you may have life. They weren't willing to come to Jesus. And isn't that sad? It, it, it really is. And it's kind of mind-boggling, is it not? The very person who lived amongst them and lived a perfect sinless life before them and did all these American mir amazing miracles and taught these American amazing things and his Sermon on the Mount, etc., Yet they weren't believing in him. Yet the same sad things happen today, do they not? People who know the scriptures and, and they read it from cover to cover even and, and can tell you about the Bible, can even quote Bible verses. Some even sit in our churches, some have been baptized or signed a decision card in some evangelistic meeting. Some are even involved in religion, quote unquote, but have never yet come to the Savior. You asked him, when did you personally repent of sin and believe in God and in His Son who died on the cross for your sins and rose again the third day to save you from your sins and call upon Him in prayer to forgive you? When have you done that? And, 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 and they look at you and kind of in a blank stare and, and, and they can't tell you. They, they knew about Jesus in their heads but not in their hearts. Someone has described it as, as, as missing heaven by 11 inches, which is what it is from the head to the heart, 11 inches. And it's sad to think that many people will be so close to heaven, just 11 inches away as it were, but yet miss out on heaven because of those 11 inches. Even religious people. The funny thing, isn't it? The very scriptures, the law of Moses, the Old Testament scriptures that spoke of the Savior, that that these men studied and they even taught, yet they still didn't receive him by faith into their lives. In fact, many rejected him. You see, dear ones, it's one thing to have the word of God in our hands. It's another thing, and to have the word of God in our hands and have it in our heads. It's another thing to have it in our hearts, you see. Jesus is the word made flesh to live amongst us. Do you have the word, Jesus, living in your heart? That's what really matters. And that's why Paul wrote in Romans chapter 10, these words, verse 9 and 10, that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth and believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. And then he said in verse 10, for with the heart one believes unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation could be here today that there is someone listening in just like these religious Jewish scribes of Jesus' day and you've read and you've studied the Bible, uh, you, you know all the facts about it, you, you've gone to church perhaps or maybe you used to go to church, or you used to go to Sunday school, you used to go to youth group or whatever, or maybe you've even said a prayer even or, or you've been baptized even, but you've never trusted in Jesus Christ to come into your heart and to save you from sin and death and hell. You'll miss heaven by 11 inches, as it were, from the head to the heart if you never personally confess faith in Jesus Christ. And we're going to give you an opportunity to do that in just a few moments at the end of our online service today. So what's the purpose of reading and studying the Bible, the written Word of God? Is it to have lots of head knowledge? No. Is it just for the sake of reading a, a good book? No. The purpose of reading and studying the Bible is to know the God of the Bible and to know the person of God's Son, Jesus Christ, the living Word. It is to have a personal relationship 
an intimate relationship with Jesus and to be growing in holiness to become more and more like Jesus and then to make him known to others. It was Athanasius who said, Jesus whom I know as my Redeemer cannot be less than God. Is that your experience? It was the great reformer Martin Luther who said, you should point to the whole man, Jesus, and say, that is God. Amen and amen. And yes, because Jesus of Jesus' claims and his witnesses found here in John chapter 5, you and I have every reason to believe in him and to say indeed of Jesus, that is God. And indeed he is. You cannot survive, dear ones, these hard times, these times of suffering, these times of crisis or times of loss in your life, if you do not believe that Jesus is God and if you do not have a personal relationship with God through His Son, Jesus Christ. No wonder many who are living without Christ today and, and without a personal relationship with Him cannot survive and who really struggle and live in fear and extreme anxiety today without Him. Jesus, in fact, in John 8, verse 24, warns us that if you do not believe that He is God in a body, you will die in your sins. That's what the Bible says. It says there in John 8, 24, Therefore I said to you, Jesus said, that you will die in your sins. Again, these are in the red letters here. For if you do not believe that I am He, that is, I am God, you will die in your sins. You see the significance of believing in Jesus and believing that He indeed is God come in the flesh, or we will die in our sins and be forever separated from a holy God and a loving God. Yes, dear ones, there is a God. There is a Heavenly Father who loves you and who gave His Son, Jesus, to die for you. God in a body who suffered in His body the pain of your sins and mine. And dear people, there's only one Savior, and His name is Jesus Christ. It's not religion. It's not religion that's going to get you into heaven. It's not even going to church that's going to get you to heaven. It's not even being, by, being baptized that's going to get you to heaven. Or doing good deeds to others. None of those things. It's only by a personal relationship with Jesus Christ that you or I, you or I are going to get into heaven. That person who is indeed God in the flesh. And only he can get us into heaven. That's why Jesus made it clear in John chapter 14, verse 6, when he said, I am the way. Not religion, not church, not good works. But Jesus said, I am the way. I am the truth and the life. No man, that's you or I, can come to the Father, who's where? In heaven, but by me. Jesus is the only way there was. It's not by religion. It's not by church. It's not by reading your Bible, saying your prayers, keeping the golden rule, the Ten Commandments. None of those things. It's simply believing in Jesus Christ, my friend. That's going to get you to heaven and having that relationship with him. So the question is, do you know this Jesus today? Not, not do you know about him, all in the head, but do you know him, whom to know is life eternal? Have you believed in him by repenting of sin and trusting him alone, being God in the flesh, so he could die for your sins as a perfect sinless Lamb of God? Only then can you have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ, the God who created you, and the Savior who loves you and who died for you. I am told that as you travel along Interstate 10 in Louisiana, that there is a large billboard which catches your eye. It stands high above the city of Louisiana, just as you start up the Mississippi River Bridge, and on it is, on it is a picture of Jesus hanging on the cross. And Jesus' head is bowed and the caption underneath reads in bold letters, it's your move. It's your move. What a powerful truth. God has already taken the initiative in salvation. He has already made his move to us. He sent Christ, his perfect son, God in the flesh to die for you and for me and to pay the price to redeem us from our sin, to set us free, and to now live a holy life. Now it's your move and it's my move. Why not come to him today? Why not cry out to him as the publican of old did? Lord, be merciful to me, a sinner, as he beat his breast. Lord, be merciful to me, to me a sinner, and save me. 
Why not make that your prayer today? And then he will then enter into your life. And you will enter into this amazing and totally satisfying relationship with the God, with God himself in the person of Jesus Christ. I'd like to pray for you today to make that life's most important decision. Father, God, you know everyone out there today who's listening in or watching in today. God, you know if there's even one person out there today that you are speaking to who has been struggling in their life with this or that, who's been questioning, maybe questioning God, and wondering if there really is a God out there who loves them, who cares about them. Lord, I pray that you would reveal to them tonight that indeed you love them and you care about them and you gave your best, you gave your Son, who is very God in the flesh, Jesus Christ, for them on that cross, so that they might believe and that they might come into a relationship with you through your Son, Jesus Christ, that they might experience that peace and that joy and that forgiveness and that purpose in life and that salvation and that gift of eternal life and that hope that only you can give, that that, that would all be theirs, their experience, oh God. And I pray that even now that your Holy Spirit would be tugging and moving it there on their heart tonight or today and revealing them to them their need of you and that they would cry out to you just as the public of old, Lord, be merciful to me, a sinner, and save me. Oh God, lead them to do that. And Lord, when they do that, then they will enter into and begin that relationship with you and your Son, Jesus Christ. Lord, help them to make that decision today. We pray. If you made that decision today, or maybe you still have questions about how to have a relationship with Jesus, I'd, I'd like to send you a free copy of the uh, True North the Gospel of John. Uh, I'd, I'd love to do that for you and also give you a excuse me here, give you a copy of, of this amazing little leaflet here uh, by Dr. Charles Stanley titled, Do You Have a Relationship with God? And then also I'd like to put in your hands uh, this little card here, Explore the Questions uh, on New Life. It's a free app for your uh, smartphones, and your iPhones, and you can go on and, and in it you can discover uh, things about God in there and, and about faith and about truth and Christianity and much more. And uh, you can read the Bible on there whenever you want to, wherever you go. You don't even need Wi-Fi. Uh, it'll be an app there for you, a free app, uh, a New Life uh, Bible app that you can you can have and, and, and enjoy that and be blessed by that and read that. So we'd love to put these all into your hands uh, here as, as a complimentary free gift, uh, a gift to you guys. Obviously it's free. And uh, if you would just uh, call us at 363-4467 or if you would email us uh, at mattcorner at live.ca or if you want to use a snail, snail mail and you want to write us a note, uh, be happy to do that. Uh, just write it to 668 Route 104, uh, Birch Corner, New Brunswick, postal code E6L2B, that is in, that is, uh, B as in Bible, uh, 2B8, and uh, addressed to the Cornerstone Bible Church. And we would love to uh, put this literature into your hands to help you uh, either make this decision to have a relationship with Jesus Christ, or if you've made that decision, to put this in your hand to help you to uh, begin to grow in your life as you begin to read the Gospel of John. That's where you need to start uh, if you are a new believer in Christ, a new follower of Jesus Christ, even here tonight, today. Uh, we'd love to do that for you. Let's pray together as we close. Father, thank you so much for your presence here with us this, this day. And Lord, you've been so good to us to allow us this opportunity to come into your holy presence and to give us this privilege, Lord, to share the greatest message the world needs to hear God, and that is a message of the person of Jesus Christ, that he is indeed God, come in the flesh to be our Savior. That's why he was born there in that manger, Emmanuel, God with us, so that he might become our Savior, the Savior who would take away our sins. That's why he came. The word Jesus means the Lord who saves. His very name means the Lord who saves. And he wants to save all who will call upon him. And I pray that many listening in today would call upon Him to be their Savior and Lord. And Lord, those of us who do know Him as Savior and Lord, that we would desire to spread the message about Him to others 
around us so that all might hear about Jesus, we pray. Burden our heart, oh God, with someone, even this week, that we can tell the good news of Jesus Christ to you. And Lord, we pray all these things in the precious name of our Lord Jesus Christ. And all God's people said, Amen and Amen.